Good evening and welcome. It is a great pleasure to be with you. Tonight is Thursday night, September 28th, 2023. Tonight we'll be looking at three different insights to give us a deeper appreciation of Sukkos, the holiday of Sukkos that begins tomorrow night. I just want to note, and I want to thank Ricky for reminding me, tonight and tomorrow is the 14th of Tishrei, which is the yard site of the Magid of Koznitz, of blessed memory. We have quoted him before, a great Hasidic and Torah leader, and this learning is dedicated in his memory. Rabbi Yitzchak Hutner writes that there are two different cycles of biblical Jewish holidays. There's the Shalosh Regalim, the three festivals, Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkos. And then there is Yamim Neroyim, the days of awe, the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkos. Sukkos, which begins tomorrow night, is the culmination, the completion of both of these cycles. Now, there are a number of ways to demonstrate how Sukkos is the culmination of both of these holiday cycles, how it fits in as the final piece for both of these cycles. But I want to share with you one this evening that is not so obvious. It requires a bit of unpacking, but I hope you will agree with me that it's worth it. It's something that every year, every day of Sukkos, I think about, and I'd like to share it with you this evening. Every day of Sukkos, except for Shabbos, so that means this year, beginning on Sunday, Sunday morning, In shul, there's a part of the service near the end called hoshanos. The word hoshana means God save us or God redeem us. So the service, this part of the service starts with that word hoshana. And every day, a different paragraph is said while we are walking around the bima in the center of the shul, holding lulav and esrog. So we're holding a lulav and esrog. We're walking in a circle around the bima, and we're saying this prayer responsively, line by line. And then, after we've made a circuit, then we stand in place and we say another prayer. And this prayer is the same one every day. It doesn't vary. And it starts with the words, Kehoshata Elim, which means, at least according to one opinion, just as you, God, saved or redeemed the patriarchs of the matriarchs, so save us now. And that's the pattern of this prayer. So that line is followed by a number of lines with the same format. Just like you saved so-and-so, similarly, God, you should save us. For example, one of the lines is, just like God, you saved the, the community of Jews who had been exiled to Bavel, to Babylonia, because after the Jews were at the destruction of the first temple, they were, Jews were exiled to Bavel, to Babylonia, but then they were brought back for the second temple. So there was a redemption. There was a saving of them. So just like you saved the Jews who had been exiled to Babylonia, Cain Hoshana, you should also save us. Okay. One of the lines in the middle reads as follows. Kehoshata mamar v'hotzeisi eschem, nakuv v'hotzeisi itchem, kein hoshana. Now the translation is like this. Just as you declared with the words, I will take you out, which could be dotted as, I will take you, I will take myself out with you. So you should save us. So what does dotted mean? Nakuv, dotted. What does that mean? And again, we're asking God to do the same for us that God did then, what is the then? What, what are we referring to? So, let's go back to a passage of the Torah near the beginning of Sefer Shmos, the book of Exodus. 
the beginning of the parsha of Eira, by Dabrar Elakim al Moshe, God speaks to Moshe. And God says, the Eira el Avram, el Yitzchak el Yaakov, I appeared to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Vagam Hakimosi has brisi itam. I made a pro- covenant with them. I made a promise with them to give their descendants the land of Canaan, the land of Israel. Vagam ani shamati as nakaz bnei Yisrael. And also God says to Moshe, I have heard the cries of the Jewish people. Asher Mitzrayim mavidim osam. The Egyptians are persecuting them. They were slaves in Egypt. I've heard their cry, and I'm remembering the promise that I made to the patriarchs. Therefore, Moshe, you go and tell the Jewish people, Ani Hashem, I am God. I am going to take them out of the land of Egypt. This is the, the putting into, uh, into work, into progress, the beginning of the Exodus, which eventually leads to the Pesach story, the Exodus from Egypt. So God says to Moshe, tell the Jewish people, Votsesi Eschem, I will take them out of the land of Israel of Egypt. Okay. I, meaning God, will take them. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I I, I made a mistake. Eschem is you plural. You, you plural. In Memphis we would say y'all. I, God, will take you plural, B'nai Israel, the Jewish people, out of Egypt. Now, we know what happens next. <laughs> what happens next is the exodus from Egypt that we celebrate with the holiday of Pesach. That's Pesach. Okay. Hebrew words are made of letters and vowels. Generally, the vowels are the marks or the dots below or beside each letter. A letter in Hebrew is called an os. A vowel is called nekuda, which means a dot. Nakuv means to place the dots, meaning to place the vowels so that you can sound out the consonants. <clears throat> However, in the Torah scroll, there are only letters, there are no vowels, there are no dots, there are no nekudot. So you have to know what the word is to know which vowels it has in order to know how to pronounce it and in order to know what it means because there are some letters that when they form a word, they can mean different words depending on which vowels you supply, depending on how you are nakuv, how you, pl- how you place the vowels, how you place the dots beside those letters. Votesi eschem means I will take you. Eschem means you, plural, meaning B'nai Yisrael, the Jewish people. Tell the Jewish people, I will take all of you out of Egypt. Okay? That's what it says. That's what it means. But if you were to change the vowels from eschem to itchem, from an e to an i, from a segol to a chiruk, then, same letters, but different vowels on the first letter, that means something different. Itchem means that God is saying, I, God, I don't mean to point to myself, I'm not, I, God, will take myself out of Egypt along with you, plural, the Jewish people. In other words, if we, to, if we were to be nakuv, if we were to place the dot under the Aleph, what God is saying to Moshe is tell the Jewish people that I, God, am in Egypt, in slavery with them. And I, God, will leave Egypt together with you at the Exodus. Now, this is a radical concept of God's imminence. And it is expressed most clearly, most clearly in Tehillim, the book of Psalms, Psalm number 91, Sadi Aleph, and which curiously, we say this psalm, this paragraph of Tehillim, we say this every Shabbos morning, and we also say it at a funeral. And 
it may be very strange to think that there is a prayer that we that is appropriate to Shabbos and to a funeral. I hope that in a moment you will see the connection of these two wildly different experiences. In this psalm, God says, "Imo anochi batzara." I, God, am with you in your suffering. Now, this does not explain why we suffer, but it describes how we suffer, which is we never suffer alone. Imo anochi batsara, God says, I am with you at every moment, from your highest moment to your lowest moment, Imo Anochi, I am with you. You are not alone. God accompanies us at every moment of our lives. This intimacy, this sense that God is with every single one of us at every moment, including our lowest moments, This intimacy is precisely what we achieved on Yom Kippur, at the end of which we yelled at the end of Nila, Hashem Hu Halakim, seven times, God is Lord. And we said that with the certainty after a day of prayer and forgiveness that we're certain that God forgives our sins if we're sincere. And we have this certainty that God is with us, that God is here, Now, right now, beside us, with us, even if we're going through something terrible, God is with us. That is what we achieved at the end of Yom Kippur. And the consequence of that intimacy on Yom Kippur and the culmination of what began on Pesach is, God says, I will take you out of Egypt, Nakuv, but dotted as if it means to say, Vahotsesi itchem, I will take myself out of Egypt and you along with me, because I also am in Egypt. I also, God says, am in slavery. I am with you. And we express this on Sukkos in two fundamental ways. We sit in a Sukkah enveloped and protected by God and we wave a lulav and esrog in all directions because that's where God is. God is right beside us. God is above us. God is below us. God is in front of us. God is behind us. Nakuv votsesi itchem. God accompanies us. God is where we are. And that's how Sukkos is the culmination of both cycles, Pesach, Shavuos, Sukkos, and Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkos. <coughs> when I was a boy, one of my heroes was Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra was a catcher for the New York Yankees baseball team. He was one of the best ever. And he also had a way with aphorisms that was unique. At first, they just sounded naive or silly, but then you would realize that there was always some deeper truth to what he said. And it was never clear if you were laughing at him or with him or maybe both. Some of his more famous quips It's deja vu all over again. I usually take a two-hour nap from one to four. You can observe a lot by watching. If you don't know where you're going, you might wind up someplace else. Baseball is 90% mental. The other half is physical. Yogi Berra. But the one that I want to focus on, and... One of his more famous ones is, it ain't over till it's over. It ain't over till it's over. 
There's a song that many of us sing on Sukkos. It's a line that is added to the benching, Birkat Mazon, the grace after meals on Sukkos, after every meal that we eat on Sukkos. And it's a paraphrase of a passage in the prophet Amos. And the line is, Harachamon, who yakim lanu es sukkas david hanofalas. The merciful one, meaning God is the merciful one who will rebuild the sukkah of David, which has fallen, who will reestablish the sukkah of David, which has fallen. Harachamon who yakim lanu es sukkas david hanofalas. It's a beautiful line. It's a beautiful song. You may hear people singing it in the sukkah. Maybe you sing it in your sukkah. Sukkah David. Sukkah David means the kingdom of David. It fell with the destruction of the temple and the exile of the Jewish people. And God will one day, hopefully soon, reestablish, rebuild that kingdom with the coming of Mashiach, with the Messianic era. That's what we're saying in this line, that God is the merciful one who will eventually, hopefully soon, do this. But the image, the metaphor is striking. Sukkas David, the sukkah of David. What does it mean? Why is a sukkah the metaphor that's used to describe David's kingdom? So I want to share with you an answer given by Rabbi Huda Amital, quoting Maharal, Rabbi Huda Lowy of Prague. Normally, a kingdom or an empire would be called bias or bait, house. For example, the Torah talks about base paro, the household, the, ki- the household, literally the household of paro, but it means the kingdom of paro. And the word bias or bait, which means house or home, is used to describe something that has a powerful reality in the world. It's, it's a permanent structure. So a, a house, a home, is it's bricks, it's wood, it's, it's, it's permanent, it's, it's strong. And so to describe an institution that is strong, we use the same word, base paro, the house of paro, means the, the kingdom, the empire of paro. Because it's strong. If a house collapses, then the symbol that it ultimately represented is nullified. Because technically speaking, if a house falls down, completely falls down, and then you rebuild it, well, you're not really rebuilding it. You're building a new house. Once a house falls down, you can't rebuild it, literally. You can build a new house in its place, meaning the effort is going to be exactly the same as if you were starting from scratch because you're starting from scratch. The house fell down. It doesn't exist anymore. So you can build a new house in this place. It might be the same, but it's still a new house. A sukkah, on the other hand, is not a complete permanent structure. It is vulnerable. It is open to the elements. And therefore, if a piece falls off, the, the, the word rebuilding does apply to it because it can be easily restored to its original state. If, if uh, uh, the schach, if the, the branches on top of the sukkah come off, let's say there's a wind, you just pick them up and put them back up again. Not on Yom Tov, but you put them back up again. It's not hard to do. The house of of David, the kingdom of David is described as a sukkah because of the potential for re-establishment following its destruction. Meaning, there was a kingdom of David during the first temple period. It fell. It was destroyed. But it was not destroyed as if a house was destroyed that could not be rebuilt. It was destroyed as if it was a sukkah that could be reestablished, 
rebuilt, renewed. Because that destruction, that falling, was not permanent and had the potential to be reversed. And Rav Amital says this is what characterizes the Jewish people. While a house is strong and stable, but if it falls, it cannot be rebuilt. But a sukkah, although it's fragile, a strong wind could knock it down, but it could be easily rebuilt. In a similar way, the Jewish people is fragile. We get knocked down. It's happened throughout our history. But we arise, we are renewed, we reestablish ourselves. In other words, let me put it in my words, it's obvious that a house is stronger than a sukkah. A house is solid, withstands the elements, withstands time. But in a certain sense, a sukkah is stronger than a house. A sukkah has a different kind of strength. The strength of resilience. The strength of recovery. The strength of renewal. And that is our strength. We have never been the most powerful empire. Our army, though today remarkable, has never been the most numerous. Yet we are an eternal people because we have the strength of a sukkah. We do not have the strength of a house. We have the strength of a sukkah. And this is true for us, the Jewish people, on a national level, and it is also a source of inspiration for every single one of us going through the personal challenges in life that we experience. Let me put this in different terms. Consider and contrast the sun and the moon. We derive light from both. The light of the sun is much, much brighter, much more powerful than the light of the moon. But the light of the moon has a strength that the sun does not exhibit to us. And that is that just when the moon's light appears to be extinguished, it is reborn. The darkness of the moon is actually just the first stage of its regrowth. We Jews follow the cycles of the moon to mark time. Our calendar is a lunar calendar because the patterns of the moon are the patterns of our history. And because that pattern can inspire and strengthen every one of us at our darkest moment. At the end of Yom Kippur, just when Yom Kippur ended, and near the beginning of every new lunar cycle, we go outside to see the moon, renewed, And we recite a prayer called Kiddush Levana, a blessing to God on the sanctification of the new month, the new moon. And in that prayer, we say the following words, God said to the moon, it should renew itself for Israel, for the Jewish people. Shehem asidim lizchadesh kamosa, for they, the Jewish people, are destined to be renewed like it. Overtly, the patterns of the moon, of the cycles of the moon, are meant to illuminate and direct the patterns of our national life and our individual lives. The story of the moon is our story. And the promise of the moon is our promise. I heard this story from Rabbi Matisio Solomon. 
there was a man, he was a religious man before the war. He survived five years concentration camps during the Holocaust. And he came out of that and remained a religious, believing, practicing Jew. Incredible. That itself is a miracle. He told the story that when he was in the concentration camp, he was so worried, among other things, that he had been a religious Jew. He wanted to remain a religious Jew, but he could not practice in any way. He wasn't able to eat kosher food. He wasn't able to observe Shabbos. He had to work. He wasn't able to put on tefillin. He, he didn't have a moment to pray. He, he could not do any mitzvos. And he, he worried to himself, how am I possibly going to come out of this as a religious believing Jew if I can't practice anything as long as I'm here? But he said the only mitzvah that he could perform was once a month at night he could go outside when he saw the moon in its new cycle and he could say this blessing of Kiddush Levana. And he said, that mitzvah, that prayer by itself, no other practices, no other mitzvahs, nothing else, that prayer sustained me through the entire Holocaust. That's the message of the moon. That's the message of the unique strength of a sukkah. That's the message of the holiday of sukkos. And then in that prayer of Kiddush Levana, we say this line, David, Melech, Yisrael, Chai Kayam. David, the king of Israel, will again live, will again be reestablished. And this is the message of the song that we will start seeing tomorrow night. Harachaman hu yakim lanu es sukas David hanafalis. God is the merciful one who will rebuild, reestablish, renew the sukkah of David that fell. Yes, it's fragile, but it ain't over till it's over. I want to share one more piece with you. I have a shortcoming that I need to work on, and I fear this is a widespread problem that we as a community need to work on improving. So I'm speaking to myself, but perhaps it will be applicable to you as well. And this applies to our religious lives as Jews globally in everything that we do, but I want to apply it specifically to the holiday of Sukkos. Now, the lack that I'm going to describe was understood by the Rav, Rabbi Yosef Soloveitchik, and he addressed this problem many, many times. And that is that all too often we perform mitzvos, we do commandments, we do what the Torah wants, what God wants us to do, but we do it in a manner that is dry, detached, perfunctory, lacking engagement or emotion. But to do such a thing is terribly, terribly wrong. The Rav said every mitzvah must combine act and emotion, behavior and feeling. The emotion and the feeling are necessary. The Rav said, the modern Jew is in dire need of religious experience and of an ecstasy in living as a Jew. No matter how committed the contemporary Jew is, we are completely unaware of the emotional dimension of the religious act, the lack of warmth and joy in observing the law and practicing Judaism is appalling, he said. The modern Jew is mostly either over-intellectualized and too sophisticated or superficial and utilitarian in his relationship with God. The Rav wrote, 
This is exactly our greatest need in North America today, to feel and experience God's presence. It's not enough to sit in a sukkah. We must feel the experience of God's embrace as we were doing it. The Rav wrote, I've quoted this to you before, it's an incredible passage. There are two aspects to the religious gesture in Judaism. Strict objective discipline and exalted subjective romance. Both are indispensable. Feelings not manifesting themselves in deeds are volatile and transient. Deeds not linked with inner experience are soulless and ritualistic. Both the subjective as well as the objective component are indispensable for the self-realization of the religious personality. Judaism is first a discipline and second a romance. First a discipline and second a romance. The discipline without the romance, just like the romance without the discipline, is incomplete. We need both. So in this vein, I want to share with you a remarkable passage from a sefer, a book called Nefesh David. It was written by Rabbi Elio David Rabinowitz to Umim. Now, Rabbi Rabinowitz to Umim lived in the early 1900s in, in Israel. He was one of the great rabbis in Jerusalem, the early 1900s. And he wrote a kind of a journal or a memoir of... He wrote down his daily routine, what, how, what his religious life was like, just on a daily basis, and how he observed the holidays, just like kind of a journal of his Jewish life. It's incredible. And I'm very grateful to Rabbi J.J. Schachter for teaching this to me. So... He writes about Shemini Hatzeres. Now, I realize we're about to start the first day of Sukkos, but at the very end, the, the caboose, the end of Sukkos, there's an eighth day appended onto the seven days of Sukkos. Outside of Israel, we observe it for two days, but in Israel, it's one day. It's called Shemini Hatzeres, the eighth day. And for Ashkenazim, that is the eighth day. That's the last day we sit in the Sukkah. We don't make the bracha leishev a sukkah on that day, but we still sit in the sukkah. And he says as follows. On Shemini Yatzeres, I would sit in the sukkah, like the other days of the holiday, which is the practice that we follow. Without anyone else seeing me, this is as he's preparing to leave the sukkah for the last time, as the holiday is coming to an end, without anyone seeing me, I would kiss the walls of the sukkah. Words cannot describe the sadness that I feel, that I felt on leaving the sukkah for the last time at the end of the holiday. Now, Only if you deeply internalize the opportunity of Sukkos to feel loved and enveloped and surrounded by God at the peak of both the Shalash Regalim, the three festivals, and the peak of the Yom Naroim, the high holidays, you see this is the culmination and the consequence. Can you imagine such an emotional outpouring? He writes... When the time would come to leave the sukkah for an entire year, and sometimes not just 12 months, but 13 months. Imagine this. Imagine this. When we finish sukkahs, it's going to be about 12 months until the next time we're in the sukkah, right? Next year. But sometimes, if there's a Jewish leap year, it's 13 months. Can you imagine feeling the difference between having to wait 12 months before being able to have the mitzvah sukkah versus having to wait an other, another month, 13 months, until you come into the sukkah again? Now, 
There is a phrase, he writes, there is a phrase that we associate with this eighth day. Kosha alai pridaskim. God says to the Jewish people, you were celebrating Sukkot for seven days, but kosha alai pridaskim, it's hard for me to part with you. Let's stay together one more day. Shemini Hatzeres. We'll stay together the eighth day, one more day. So he writes, this is Rabbi Rabinovich to Umim writing. He writes, just as it is the nature of a person to be emotional when someone they love and they're with that person and now they're going to leave that person and they're not going to see them for a whole year. Imagine the tears and the sadness at parting. And you know, if I'm only going to see a person that I love very much in another year, who knows what's going to happen between now and the next year? It's exactly the same. We have this mitzvah to be able to immerse ourselves in this sukkah, our entire body. The mitzvah sukkah is unique in the entire Torah. It is the only mitzvah that we perform with our entire body. Every single part of our body is fulfilling this mitzvah of sukkah. It's not just our hands or our feet or our mouth or our brain or any other single part. It's our whole body that is inside the sukkah. Who can imagine such an amazing, amazing mitzvah? And to leave it is emotional and brings tears, just like leaving a loved one that we're not going to see. So what I need to work on, and if you think you do, then join me, is not to see these words as the florid language of an ecstatic and emotional mystic, but as a goal for every one of us, as a necessary accompaniment to our Jewish behavior, because our Jewish behavior without our Jewish emotions is lacking. And it is a big problem because we need this, both the behavior and the emotion, in order to be Jewishly strong and for sure in order for our children and grandchildren to be Jewishly strong. It will not happen if we only transmit behavior, and it will not happen if we only transmit emotion. It's got to be both together. So my goal for this year, and I ask you to accept this challenge as your goal, starting tomorrow night, my goal is not just to live in our sukkah, but to love our sukkah. To love being in our sukkah. To love God's gentle embrace in our sukkah. And to miss it when it's over. My friends, I wish you a good evening and a beautiful, romantic Sukkos holiday. And I look forward to seeing you soon in person.